You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. Hello, my name is Stephen Daniels, and I'm the host of Clock Blockers, the number one Miami fan show, and that's another Miami Dolphins first down podcast right here on Dolphins Talk. Before you watch this video or listen to it on audio, do me a huge favor. If you're watching this right now, hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to hit the bell notification. That way you get notified anytime Dolphins Talk goes live. If you're listening to this, wherever it is you get podcasts, make sure you subscribe to Dolphins Talk. We want you to get the best content about your favorite football team, the Miami Dolphins. Now, enjoy this exclusive content right here on Dolphins Talk. And we are back live on Clock Blockers, the number one Miami fan show, live right here on Dolphins Talk. If you're watching this right now, do me a huge favor. Hit the like button. Share the link. Let people know that we're here. We can't grow without your help. Uh, and and let me tell you, today's show, today's show is a doozy. We got a great guest, a guest that is one of the busiest men in the community. And around this time of year, he's doing nothing but uh, work, putting in that work for NFL draft and free agency. Uh, it, look, he's he's one of the hardest working people in the Miami Dolphin community. I love him. You love him from Locked On Dolphins. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kyle Krabs. What's up, Steven? How are you, up, man? How I appreciate, are you? appreciate the kind words, and it's good to hop on and catch up with you and, and talk about a lot of changes for this team that change can be scary, right? But it doesn't have to be scary as long as you kind of understand the why. And that's really, you know, one of the things that I enjoy most about doing Dolphins content is like, a lot of my work, whether it was with Draft Network or before Draft Network with NDT Scouting or with Locked On NFL Scouting that I do now, you see and you study all 32 teams and, and how the teams approach any given offseason. Mm -hmm. And you kind of get to see the, the trends and the trend lines and the thought process behind things. And I think it's it's really allowed me to enjoy this offseason amidst the scariness of this offseason of no Andrew Van Ginkle and no Christian Wilkins and no Robert Hunt. And like that stunk. That was a really crappy day. Right. Let's be completely honest. Mm -hmm. But the big picture view for Miami and what that means for ensuring that Jalen Waddles here long term as like an opportunity cost of not doing those contracts so that you are in position to give the kind of contract you're going to have to get give to Jalen Waddle and what you did with that money short term to bring new players in. It's a really fascinating mix and blend. And I know that's one of the things that you want to talk about here today on the show. Definitely, man. I enjoy watching your content. Number one, because it's a breath of fresh air sometimes in the community from all the doom and gloom. Um, and, and the other part to it is, is like, you actually believe it, right? Like you see it. One of the things that jumped out to me this off season was, you hit the nail on the head for what the Dolphins were going to do at center this year. You called Aaron Brewer coming to the Dolphins. I didn't have that on my bingo card at all, Kyle, at all. So I don't know what you did or how you knew it, but I think that's where I want to begin the conversation with yeah. you. How did you know where, how did Aaron get on your radar and why? And when the Dolphins did finally pull the trigger, you were like, all right, let's go. We're ready. So I had, Going into free agency, I had a board, and it was almost like a, a draft board, but it was for free agents, and it was about 200 players deep. And I put the Dolphins players on up there, and I evaluate every player through 10 traits that I think are core to what Miami wants to do at that position in understanding how their offense and their defense works. Mm -hmm. And I grade. It, it's on a curve. There's, there's values and skills that are more important than other I say all that to say there's like a number out of 100 that every player gets assigned. So I put the players on the roster for Miami. I put them up on the board. And then I stack and I grade free agents and I project them into this offense or this defense. And I put them on the board numerically. And you can kind of see this is what they have. This is what they had. And this is what else is out there. And seeing Aaron Brewer from Tennessee Playing at center this year, when you watch the tape, you saw a player that was not as physically overwhelmed as what he was at guard. You know, the year prior, he played guard for Tennessee. And you know that that's a, a hard way to make a living at, as an undersized player at guard. 
when you got to deal with the explosiveness of three techniques, but then you also have to deal with power in certain instances at center. I thought he was much more effective of not being covered up by somebody all the time. So there's a lot more instances in which he's able to be turning to a linebacker or a rush player or helping on a, a interior defensive lineman, helping his guard to, to keep a gap uh, as compared to dealing with, with that pressure upfield initially on his own. And then you saw him, because he's uncovered on the line of scrimmage, more often being able to get out into space, get up onto the second level and not have to fight through somebody lined up on my inside shoulder where I can't go up and climb on a linebacker or release in the screen game and get outside the hashes and pick up guys in space and just this functional athleticism that's like, hey, that's kind of like pretty parallel to Connor Williams. When, when you think about Connor Williams and, and yep. how he came over and this big con controversial decision when they signed him to move him to center, and I saw a lot of the same parallels in, in what their strengths were as players. You say, hey, that, that's a player that you could probably get for cheaper because he's a less proven player. He's a younger player, but brings the same kinds of values to that position that he was able to show. And at least you have a year's proof of concept because he played center for Tennessee last year. You know, and looking at that, you had a lot of different people to choose from in free agency and potentially the draft. Was Aaron Brewer your number one person that you wanted to replace Connor Williams, knowing Connor's uh, number one, what he could pull potentially in free agency? Number two is injury, first and foremost, probably. And was Aaron Brewer the guy that you thought this is the best fit that the Dolphins can have? Or was there somebody else that you liked or somebody maybe even in the draft that could potentially be a really good pick? Well, I'm glad that you mentioned all the different ways that you can kind of come to these decisions uh, because there's always opportunity cost. I think one thing that I've referenced this past week on Locked on Dolphins is um, everybody just wants to talk about an X and a Y axis. How good is the player and how much does he cost? But then there's also the third dimension to every decision that you make, which is what is the impact on every other decision that you make in the off season, right? And, and I would say that I had eyes primarily on Andre James, the center from the Raiders as my number one, I had him graded as a higher player, as a better player than, than Aaron Brewer, but he signed a three year, $24 million contract extension on March 10th before the league calendar year opened. So he never hit the, he never hit the market. He re-signed with the Raiders. So once that one signed Lloyd Cushenberry was the next center, but you were expecting him to be a 10, $11 million player. He ends up getting 12, I think uh, in free agency from Tennessee well, if you're going to pay that kind of money, it probably would have already gone to Connor Williams uh, you know, when he had his contract hold out or whatever it was in the summertime. So he was Brewer was like the best available within the budget that Miami seems to have. Wanted Does that to bother you, though, from a Chris Greer standpoint? Does that bother you or do you think that it? it is Brewer still going to be effective enough for us to win games? Now, mind you, the Dolphins had 13 different starting combinations on the offensive line last year, and right. we saw when Connor left how that center position decreased as far as protection and just, you know, the the level I mean, of play. Dude, Con Connor's impact in the loss to Tennessee last year, like that possession when he went down was when they had the, the fumble snap and yep. uh, they ended up moving – Liam went to center and they already had Lester cotton in. And then Robert Jones came in off the bench and that fumble that Tua had uh, on the two yard line, Robert Jones, who just came off the bench, stepped the wrong way and let a free runner through the a gap. Yeah. So it's like the, the domino effect for all of them. Right. And I know the offensive lines is big, super sore spot, but your ninth best offensive lineman played 600 snaps last year. And so some of that is, I don't well, think I realized that. Say that it, one more time. Lester, Lester Cotton, if you do, if you go off the performance and how good they were as players, Lester Cotton was your ninth offensive lineman last year. He played he 600 played snaps. 600 plus he played, snaps? He still played 616 snaps. Connor Williams and Robert Hunt didn't even play 500. Wow. So when you think of it that way, and, and Dolphins fans want to get mad about, well, you invested in Toronto Armstead and you knew exactly what it was. It's like, you're right. That's why he was available in free agency. And even at the time, Jawan Taylor signed for 20 million. You got Teron for 15. And then Teron just redid his contract for this upcoming year. So, like, it's appropriate value for how good he is as a player, knowing that you're going to have to have a contingency plan there. But Connor Williams and Robert Hunt going down and missing 
60 percent of the season that was not accounted for that was not accounted for right i mean those guys both both played 100 percent of the snaps the previous season so the domino effect of that is okay you're gonna have to make sure you have a deeper unit than what you did last year your ninth best player has to be better than what your ninth best player was this past year and we'll see with jack driscoll isaiah win i think isaiah win ideally is not a starter for you this year I think Brewer does have a floor. good thing, though, right? If a, if there was a starter last year and he's not this year, does that mean that your offensive line has improved, Kyle? In theory, yes. Okay. So that that's kind of where I am at with you know if, if Win is your swing tackle, but also like your backup guard because he can play guard. Like if if they end up if Kendall Lamb retires or whatever happens with Kendall Lamb and they mm -hmm. don't have Kendall Lamb back. If Isaiah Wynn, who's back for less than $2 million this, this upcoming season, is your primary swing tackle to play because he's played in the NFL, taking snaps and started at both right and left tackle, and you know that guy can also play guard, but he's a backup, you feel really good if he has to come into a game for a short stint of time. So I, I think that's where the depth can be better, but you you have to bank, you can't bank on your center having two separate injuries your Pro Bowl caliber guard having two separate incidences of a hamstring issue that he misses, what, seven games in a two-month stretch yep. and then comes back. You know, it's it's like when it rains, it pours, and it poured for him last year. If you were asking me, all right, at pick 21, the Dolphins should go get, I have been preaching and saying Joshua Power Jackson, whatever his name is for Morgan, right, mm -hmm. the, the, the center for Morgan. Should I be saying that now? Is no. that something? Okay. And it has less. It has less to do with the offensive lineman that's on the roster. What 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 issues did you have with Connor Williams' snaps? I mean, I thought I, PFF had him graded as the number one rated center, but mm -hmm. it does not take into account snapping. And for me, I have said it and preached on my channel: two snaps a game minimum, you're getting a bad snap from him. And now, so I don't know how that, that compares to the rest of the NFL, but I know that it's detrimental from us because it always seems to be on a big play. Seems to be. Jackson Powers Johnson has more bad snaps on his film on a game-by-game -game basis than Connor Williams ever did as a member of the Miami Dolphins. So that's the part of Jackson Powers Johnson that has me, and nobody's talking about snaps, right? Like Nobody he, is, yeah. He was a guard in 2024 or in 2022 for Oregon, and then he moved to center this year. And there's just, I'm reaching over here. They're on their own two yard line. He's got to reach over across the right guard or across his whole body to try and get it. And they get it in the mesh point. They fumble the ball. It gets kicked around. They, they luckily recovered on their own two yard line, but they're back. To, they're in their own red zone and there's a bad snap. They're in scoring territory. And he literally rolls one back like a bowling ball. And then there's this mad scramble to jump on the ball. These are in separate games and, and it's game by game by game. There's false start issues as the center. I watched four games. I think there were three false starts in four games at the center position. So it was new to him. So that's one issue that I have with Jackson Powers Johnson. And the other is you've paid Aaron Brewer $7 million per season, and his best position is center. I've seen NFL tape at him at guard, and it's, it's not, not good. as good as what it is at center. So you've invested the money already in that guy. He should play where he's best. And you should complement and fill out around that. But that's not a small investment. That's what you paid Connor Williams the last two seasons. Who, so who's your backup center next year? I think you can probably get away with finding someone in the draft in the middle rounds or the late rounds that is a center-specific player. Just because if it's that narrow of a skill set, you can go that regard. Heaven forbid they choose to do Liam Eikenberg. They could choose to do Liam Eikenberg. They could draft... Um, what about the opportunity to bring Connor back later on in the year? Yeah, I, th I think that's a possibility. Um, if he's going to hang around and make sure that his recovery is at a certain place, okay, that's going to put it where Miami financially would would have the means to make a, a competitive offer, probably on a short term deal. And from his rehab standpoint, it would probably be best for him to do that for him. Yeah. So I I, I wouldn't completely dismiss Connor, but even if Connor's back, like. I would probably want Aaron because Aaron's a smaller player. I would want the smaller player with less anchor to play at center as compared to at guard. So give me your starting offensive line next year. Do you, It's Jackson at right tackle, right? Austin Jackson at right tackle. 
Um, Jones at right guard. I don't want him starting, but I think right now that's your starter. Brewer at center, you like. Yep. Yep. Our lads has Isaiah win, but you're telling me it shouldn't be well, Isaiah. So if you told me one of Win or Robert Jones should start, Win had better take. The issue is just relying on Win for any extended period of time or expecting him to play the whole season is foolhardy because he's done it once in five years. So the Dolphins at pick 21 should go get a guard then. I a think guarding I, guard. I, I think that's a part of the conversation in a perfect world, you find a, a tackle who can play guard and you play him there in year one, you play him at guard. And then when you transition away from Toron Armstead, you have the succession plan in place for Toron Armstead. So if you're drafting a first round offensive lineman, that would be the requisite ability that I would want in a player that you Is would. Are there any play. names that you can think, uh, can tell us that you like? Uh, Troy Fatanu from Washington. Okay. Is I, he's been on my draft board too. Yeah. Rock star. He, he is a stud. So he would be up there for me. Uh, I just did for today's Locked On Dolphins, I did uh, Graham Barton and uh, Talise Fuaga from Oregon State. Graham Barton's from Duke. Barton could also be a backup center candidate. He's snapped early in his career. I think he's better at guard long term. Um, I, th I actually think uh, Fuaga is better at guard long term as well. So you don't love like the positional value element there, but those are kind of names that are first round names in the conversation. If you if you get the round two and you just want to draft a starting guard, I think Christian Haynes from Connecticut is one of the better zone blocking offensive linemen in this year's class. And he's potentially there at 55 for you if you win a different direction in the first round. What do you expect the Dolphins to do between draft and the rest of free agency to address the offensive line? And on a scale of one to 10, how confident are you in the starting offensive line? I don't want to say now. I want to say your take on what it could be after free agency pretty much ends. I think I think it could be. I, I don't think this, the physical ceiling of the five individual players will be as high as what it was last year. When mm. you consider Connor Williams with what, with what he was, Robert Hunt, you're, you're not going to replace Robert Hunt. Now you can get quality guard play for a fraction of the cost of what Robert Hunt got. So that's like the responsible financial decision, unfortunately, to make if Carolina is going to pay him uh pass rusher money. To the Carolina football. paid him ridiculous. Correct. Amount of money. And, and, there was yeah, no way we needed to pay him that. Same for Christian Wilkins, right? Like 27 yeah. and a half for Christian Wilkins and 20 for Robert Hunt is like, y'all are outstanding players. But if, if go get your you want to take this opportunity, bag. go get your bag, go get your bag, dude. Like, I'm not going to hold it against you. They're going to offer you that kind of money. But like in a vacuum, if you told me in November that Miami signed Christian Wilkins for 27 and a half per or Robert Hunt for 20 million per, what do you think the consensus reaction from Dolphins fans it would be? Been? What are they, they doing? Lost their mind. Wow. Yes. Right. 100%. So um, I, I think the offensive line is a really unique group because it's the one in the 10 years or so that I've been doing this, it's the one spot that I have been convinced in talking to people or people that have been around it that the sum of the whole is more valuable than the sum of the individual parts. So you could have five Pro Bowl players on your offensive line, Pro Bowl caliber players on your offensive line, but if they don't play within the scheme and they don't see things the same, it's not going to matter. It's still going to be a disjointed unit because they all have to understand the, the game the same way, see the game the same way, understand how the concept works, understand the front that they're seeing, and what the motion that's going to happen is going to do to the front at the point of the snap for how it's going to change, what their landmark is. So there's like all of that, I think, makes it you, you may have a lesser player at right guard and you may have a lesser player at center. But with another year in the system and if they get players that click with what they are trying to do and understand conceptually how it works, it can be, I think, a comparable unit to what it was supposed to be last year. I don't think it'll be better. I don't think the town will be as good, but I think it could be a comparable unit to what it was supposed to be when you had all the guys in at the beginning of the season before okay. all the injuries took hold. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Clock blockers, Miami fans, number one Miami fan show right here on Dolphins Talk. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the like button. If you like what you're watching right now, you guys can also hit the YouTube super thanks, which is the dollar sign with the heart, uh, with the heart, with the dollar sign in the middle. You guys can donate to the channel and help the channel grow that way as well. 
All right, Kyle, let's go ahead and let's transition into draft talk. Miami mm-hmm. has some picks for the first time in the first few rounds, uh, rather than what they've had the last couple of years in trading some uh, draft picks away. We have pick number 21. There are a lot of different theories that are being thrown out there in the community, as well as uh, insiders and draft experts. What do you see the Miami Dolphins doing at pick number 21? And what do you want to see them do at pick 21? I want them to take the best available player at a position that will have an opportunity for that player to contribute this year. So that could be defensive tackle. It could be offensive tackle with ability to play guard. It could be, I would doubt it, be wide receiver. It could be, but I would doubt it, be tight end if Brock Bowers was there. Like there, there's, I have enough different spots on a projected 53 where it's like, well, we could really use an upgrade here. We could use an upgrade here. I want to find the best talent that's available to step into one of those roles to play meaningful snaps for the Dolphins. I don't want to have another Cam Smith. I don't want to have another Channing Tindall. Now, that's not to say Cam Smith's not going to be a really good player for the Dolphins long term. And who's who's to say uh, at this point in uh, Channing Tindall's career, we'd already written off Austin Jackson to be in the same boat. Right. Yep. And like he's he become a valuable member of the team at some point in some stage, he gets the playing opportunity to do so. So that's not to write those guys off. But if you're going to let Christian Wilkins walk and you're going to go get a bunch of bodies and spam the position uh, to try to find some competition, that's one thing. But you still need to find a needle mover to take some of that workload that Christian Wilkins had and have a disruptive player in that spot. So whether it's, Defensive tackle, offensive line to be one of your best available five starting offensive linemen. Uh, potentially a, a pass rusher, I think, is still absolutely on the table. Chop Robinson? I like Chop. He would pro- probably wouldn't be my top choice at 21. Okay. The athletic profile's through the roof. And I went to Penn State, so I've seen plenty. Of I love right. the kid. I love him. Plays with his hair on fire, right? Yeah. Good um, kid. If you wanted somebody to be a designated pass rusher early in his career and come in and, and bring speed, I think Chop's a good candidate for that. Um, but not at I, 21. Well, I, I think at 21. Who is still have, on the board at 21 that you're not getting? Or how many people that you like came off the board in those first 20 picks where Chop Robinson is the best value at that right. moment? I, I think it's it's going to be mathematically possible for at the positions that we've talked about for Chop to be what I would perceive to be the best available player at 21. I think okay. there will be a better talent. So I like Chop. And like if somebody took him in the first round, I totally get it. But if Leotu Latu from UCLA is still out there, I think he's a better pass rusher than Chop Robinson. If Jared Verse from Florida State's out there, I think that's he's going to be very high up on my list of like just best available talent. And they rotate defensive linemen, so like that that would be a, a spot where a guy could get meaningful snaps, even if it feels redundant to bring in another pass rusher because you got Shaq Barrett on a one year deal. Uh, Bradley Chubb is that going to be one of those contracts that you transition away from in the next two years? Uh, as you get ready to pay Jalen Phillips, you know, it's, it's the same question with like wide receiver. And are you going to transition away from Tyree kill as you get ready to pay Jalen Waddle? Like they're, I, they're, there's succession plans that feel like they I, could I be there. The succession plans. I've been very adamant on my channel that if the dolphins draft a wide receiver in the first round, I'll lose it. I will absolutely lose it. Like there it's, I don't, unless it's Marvin Harrison, which he's not going to be there at 21 and there's no way that's ever going to happen. Unless it was him, there was absolutely no reason to draft a, a wide receiver at number 21 with what we have. None. I, would be, I would be inclined to agree with you because it's a really good wide receiver class. Now, if your first pick is wide receiver, then get down and get yourself a three and some future draft picks. Like, if you can cash in on somebody being really desperate for a player at 21, say QB5, say Michael Penix is still out there and somebody desperately wants to draft Michael Penix, they passed on him early in the round, they want to come up from pick 34, just as th- I'm throwing an arbitrary number out there. I'm not saying that's an actual thing. Yeah. And they want to give you a first round pick next year. And they're going to give you a, a, a 34 and a three this year and a five. And then a one next year, if somebody's going to give you that kind of price, and then you want to go down and you say, Hey, we really like Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. We're going to draft him at 34. That'll be our first pick in the draft class, but you get an extra one, you get an extra three this year. Nobody's going to complain about that. Right. No, I that, that's the pathway to taking a wide receiver that like, I'm totally cool with. 
with your first pick. The odds of that happening are slim to none. I would agree. Yes. <laughs> well, oh, let me let me ask you why why I have you as far as uh, the draft is concerned, as well as the wide receiving position. Who do you expect to be the number three next year? And do you expect the Dolphins to draft a wide receiver in the second or third round potentially? I don't think they're done. Obviously, the Odell thing if, if it happens before the draft that would lock that in and i would say odell will be the three okay and you would not draft the wide receiver if odell doesn't happen uh, i think maybe they let the board come to them there's a couple guys that i really like for miami leggett from south carolina is one of them he's my favorite of like the big bodied super explosive guys you do have ezu kanma who i, I don't want to completely write off either it looked like he was going to have like this really unique role in the offense last year before the Never neck injury uh, so obviously he goes down with a neck injury. It felt like Chase Claypool was them kind of chasing a player that could take some of those reps. And then the light bulb just never came on for Claypool. So we, we, that sunk cost. It is what it is. You'll move on from it. So, uh, I think as you somebody, they would, they would love to have a role for, but it would be irresponsible to not have another answer or some competition for that spot. So if Odell doesn't happen, I am inclined to think that they will find a wide receiver somewhere to come in and at least compete for that wide receiver three. Okay. All right. Let's go to the defensive side. Uh, you know, we got two amazing pass rushers who are not going to start the year on the active roster. We've already kind of discussed Chop Robinson and uh, potentially some other people within the draft of that first round who the Dolphins could potentially go after. When do you expect Phillips and Chubb to be back? Like, what do you think? And ultimately, what do you think, you know, uh, that other pass rusher is going to be for the Dolphins this year? Is it going to be a rookie? Do you expect them maybe to go out in free agency in the second wave? Um, Jalen Phillips was making it really hard for me to write him off. I know. <laughs> that he'll be, that Those he's videos be are crazy. Those yep. videos are insane. So I think JP obviously having suffered the injury earlier than, than Bradley and look, even at JP's back expecting him to be the JP that we know he's capable of being right off the jump is maybe a little ambitious. It might take him a little bit into the season before he kind of looks like that player with the explosiveness that he's capable of having. So I do think it'll be a position and look, the, the Dolphins track record speaks for itself. Look at go back to 2019 and if you want to go back even further than that with like the breadcrumbs of Chris Greer was the general manager, but how much control did he actually have? Go back to 2016. It's offensive tackles, it's defensive ends, it's cornerbacks, it's wide receivers, it's quarterbacks. All those premium positions is where they are investing their early draft picks. And so I think edge rusher would be a spot where there's potential uh, for them to have the appetite to spend. And it's it's a good group, uh, just, to, just not necessarily at the top of tippy top of the draft top 15 picks. Okay. All right. All right. Well, look, there's a lot of conversation about draft that we're going to get into over the next couple of weeks. Uh, one of the things that, you know, has been a discussion throughout the Dolphin community, Kyle, is the outlook of this year. There are some people that before we kind of dove into free agency a little bit said, look, this could be a reset year. Dolphins aren't re-signing players. They're going out and getting some aged veterans. Uh, I don't see it that way personally. Um, and, and, to go out for me, the kicker was Fuller going out and getting Kendall Fuller was a huge thing for me. Mm -hmm. What, why should Dolphin fans be optimistic about the success or potential success of this team this year, even with eight new starters potentially on defense, um, up to eight? And, you know, with some of the injuries that will still be going into this year. Why should Dolphin fans be optimistic about this upcoming season, Kyle? I, I think the first thing that comes to my mind here is they very clearly sent a message that they are not just going to lay down and let players walk and take their lumps. I mean, Fuller, Brooks, Poyer, I mean, th these are meaningful players. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the defensive side of the ball specifically, I, I think what they have done um is attack one of their their weaknesses which was coverage in the middle of the field and oh, with tight ends and running backs oh, we all remember the baltimore game and and what that looked like and, and it feels like it's been a thing for miami for forever well, i go back to 2022 versus 2023 and a lot of the biggest looming questions or, or pain points for that 2022 to 2023 team they addressed they attacked and they got better at 
And mm -hmm. it seems like they're doing the same thing. And part of that was only achievable by having the funds available to spend for five guys, which you would otherwise spend for one, which is what they did with Christian Wilkins walking and $27 million annually versus Jordan. Bro like you add up the cap hits of Barrett and Fuller Poyer. and Poyer and Brooks, you add up all those salary cap hits. It's like equal to what Christian Wilkins would have been on the franchise tag if they kept. And all those players stuff. are going to be quality and contribute to the Correct. success. So it's a it's a deeper team. Yeah. But what you've done the past few years is you've went out and you accumulated players that you thought were like cornerstone pillar players that you could build around. You still have a lot of those, and now you have what is a deeper unit that they seem to have. Uh, try to to tailor to coach Weaver and and what he wants to do defensively. So I, I think they'll they have the opportunity to address their biggest issues with how last season went, and they had success doing that last year in itself too. You know, I I want the Dolphins to obviously get over the hump this year. Last couple of years, injuries have been a big plague to this team. Uh, you can say that Mike McDaniel in his uh, inability. It's so weird. Having an offensive-minded coach who's given us two top 10 seasons of an offense and to say that he's potentially on the hot seat this year and he needs to overcome like sticking to the run game is, is such a weird thing for me to say because for the past 25 years, I would have killed to have a head coach who gave us an offense of top 10 the prior two seasons. And we're right. still considering him being potentially on the hot seat this year. What's your outlook of McDaniel? What's your outlook of, of Greer this year? And what are the, what do the dolphins need to do to, to get over that hump and win a playoff game? And you just love to be healthy at the right time of year for starters. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you can't really control it. And so, and some of how they have attacked team building has been, we like to find good values and the way that we find good values is sometimes a, t a player of a certain talent level is available because of other questions. And that's that's the risk, the incurred risk that you have when you play building a roster that way is you may get to December and you got smaller wide receivers that have a bunch of lower body injuries and get banged up and they don't run the way that they're supposed to or they they can't play at all. And you got a $15 million year offensive tackle that's only available because he's really a $20 million offensive tackle, but he misses five, six games every single year. And what's his health look like? Like, so. That part of it, the stars have to align for you. That's completely out of your control, and that's the unfortunate nature of the game. Like that's why you play the game. Now, uh, I think they can help themselves in certain areas by doing the right, easy thing. Like if you're winning in the second half of a game, run the ball into a heavy box for once. For starters, they almost never did it last year. They they structurally let teams take away the run just by how they lined up defensively. You can't keep doing that. Like that that can't be a thing. But for Miami to have 20 wins over the last two seasons, two playoff berths, two top 10 offenses. Like that's what Mike McDaniel was brought here to do. And this is a first time head coach. Like, I don't know why this is a surprise to anybody that like the biggest concern when you moved on from Flores was, well, look, you're kind of a few years invested into building your roster. Can you find a coach that's been in a head coaching spot before? So the, like the game management and mechanics elements of being a head coach are not problems for you. The decision Seven first-time head coaches in a row, Kyle. The, Seven first the decision that they made was the ceiling of the offensive in, in, intuition and uh, ingenuity that Mike McDaniel has outweighs experience, and it has until it hasn't, and that's kind of where they're at. Well, now you have two years under your belt, Mike. What do you got? And I think that's the big thing for him is don't keep making the same mistakes again. You're not guaranteed to have 12 wins and a playoff win, but don't make the same mistakes again while being who you are and bringing the value that you bring. But he did make the same mistakes again in year two that he made in year one. And there are some people that are like, well, he didn't learn from his mistakes in the first year. I think even though that he did make some of the same mistakes, the injuries at the end of the year, you couldn't walk away from it. Like there, there was just no walking away from that. You had three guys that had three days of practice that started a playoff game and the fourth coldest playoff game in NFL history against the defending and what ended up being the Super Bowl champions. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? 
Like, well, let's be real about this. If if you're being real, you should have not blown a 14 point lead against Tennessee on Monday night football. And you'd have a home game and play the Pittsburgh Steelers as a seven seed. And you win that darn playoff game that everybody's so upset that you Get can't the monkey win. off your back. But, but then if you do that and you beat Pittsburgh and then you go in the divisional round and say you lose the same way that you did in the, the wild card round, does anybody do like, do you really feel any better or are you I, just in the same spot? That's a good question, Kyle. Oh, um, <laughs> Wow, we beat we beat Mason Rudolph led Pittsburgh at home in the wild card. So it's I I get the playoff. If they want uh, for me. I would probably say I'm where I'm at right now, which is okay. We let's say hypothetically speaking, we won a, a wild card game. All right, we got that monkey off our back. Now. We can't use injuries as an excuse this year. We can't use McDaniel's, you know, uh, uh, abandoning the run as an like there is a, to me there is no excuse this year. But the sad part about it is, I am telling a team that has had two years in a row of being a top ten offense that hasn't won a playoff game and saying to them, "You have no excuse this year but to make a deep playoff run." How is that fair? Like what team jumps from not winning a playoff game to being Super Bowl contenders like that? Now well, I understand it's not like that. This is the third year of this team being here. But let's be honest with ourselves. There's not a lot of teams in the history of the NFL that you could point to and say that's a fit like that's fair. It's just not. Well, the people that are fed up with no playoff wins don't don't care. And the twenty twenty three Dolphins are responsible for the sins of uh, Ricky retiring on the eve of training camp and what that O2 team losing two games at the end of the season and missing the playoffs altogether. And uh, Chad Pennington's performance against Baltimore in 08 and uh, Tannehill going down with the ACL in 16. Like Damn, it, 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 it all, <laughs> it, it's, it's all one thing and it really shouldn't be all one thing, but I understand why the people that are fed up and, and frustrated, I understand why they feel that way. And I'm not going to tell you, you can't feel that way. I just don't think you're properly applying the context of what this team is doing. If you're looking at all those other incidences and saying, you have to do this because they didn't, or like, I'm going to be mad at you for so what's a successful year for you this year, Kyle, put yourself in a position to compete for a Super Bowl by being in the playoffs and don't beat yourself when you get there. The ball will bounce one way or another. It's the unfortunate reality. Like there's, there are other there there are other teams across the league like <clears throat> Buffalo, right? Buffalo has been really good the past six years. Their fan bases are having the exact same conversation that we're having, but it's just the ceiling is the divisional round of the playoffs instead of winning a playoff game. That's it's like ev everybody's got like the same barrier it's just how high the barrier goes but you my, don't Mike feel Tomlin like, and the Steelers you, keep you making the playoffs any, but you don't feel do any better if the barrier is the divisional round or you can't beat the Chiefs because for the Dolphins it's well we can't beat the Bills if the Dolphins beat the Bills half the times they lost to them they'd have a top six record in the NFL the last four seasons combined but they can't beat the Bills they're one in 10 against the Bills or whatever it is they have a 65 percent win percentage against every other team in the league in the last like three years so but does that make them a good football team or a mediocre one or a bad I, one? I think the Dolphins are a good football team that has to solve the riddle of one specific opponent that is the barrier for them in playing home playoff games. Well, I and think Jordan Poyer is going to have a lot to say about that this year. Let's, let's hope he does. I hope he does. <laughs> but I, I, right I, 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 I consider 2023 a successful Dolphins campaign, even though it was not a fulfilling Dolphins campaign, campaign if that makes sense. To me, it does. I think there will be a lot of fans that will disagree with you. I And you're totally entitled to feel that way. But again, if you look at it through the lens of all 32 teams and what happens across the entirety of this league, there's only one team that brings home the trophy. And I, I can't hold the past two teams accountable for what happened in 08. I just can't. I can't do it. I'm, I'm, I can't get there. You watch a lot of football. I, I was going to wrap up the show, but you brought up something that triggered this question and we had 20 years of the Patriots and Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. We've now had what five years of, you know, Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs. Mm -hmm. Why are, 
why look for the last 25 years in the NFL, it's been dynasties. It's been that have just ran the league. You realize that Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady account for like, what is it? Like 13 of the last 25 AFC appearances in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's and insane. Then had, and then you had what? Two Ben Roethlisberger's in there. And you, you had, had a Roethlisberger, Peyton, a Flacco. You had Peyton Manning on a couple and, of occasions. And a Peyton Manning. That's it. By the way, all Hall of Famers, with the exception of maybe Flacco, and he he might get in, might, long shot, but he might. So the argument is, well, we, we need to aspire to have that and to have that, that caliber of, of a player and or that, that caliber of a team. And I would generally agree, but saying it versus doing it, it's, it's a lot easier to say it. Like, if you want to have that observation, go find me that player in this year's class. Go find yep. me that what go find me that one player that's going to make that. But everybody, well. so here's where you're going to, and I'm just playing devil's advocate here, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to be like, two is not that guy. Well, there's a good portion of the fan base. They're going to say two is not that guy. He can't get us over Patrick Mahomes. Hell, he can't get us over Josh Allen. How's he going to get us over Patrick Mahomes? I disagree with that. I think we haven't seen the ceiling yet for Tua, and I'm a huge fan of him. And I'm not trying to get into a Tua debate here, mm -hmm. but I. that's where everybody brings it to that's where everybody in this fan base brings it to they bring it back to uno they bring it back to the quarterback and if you go look at success in the nfl teams over the last 25 years all these teams that made a super bowl or won a super bowl 85 to 90 percent of them have hall of fame quarterbacks see that's that's my point so it's very easy to say well two is not the guy who do you want go show me the guy in this year's class that you show me an, a realistic investment opportunity. So what? And then you're gonna say, oh, well, they don't have it. So we got to tear the whole thing down and tank another year oh, to get another top pick for a rookie that you don't know what you're gonna get. Like, come on, like, I agree. You, 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 you choose the path that you're on. You choose the identity of who you are as a football team, and you work to try to optimize it. San Francisco's made how many runs with how many different quarterbacks now? Like, Alex and I get Catholic, that it's Alex Smith. I, and now uh, Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy, and you had Jimmy G. You played in the yep, Super Bowl. And Jimmy G. Forgot about him. So it's like I I get that's the AFC versus the NFC side of things, but all you can do is put yourself in the position to be the best version of whatever team you want to choose to be, and then like it's either going to go your way or it's not. And there's a part of that that none of us can control, and you either have peace with that or you don't. And if you don't have peace with that, then you say I want the Hall of Fame quarterback so that I feel like we're going to get it done. But saying it, there's only there's only a couple of teams that have a call. The That's Hall of exactly right. So so I don't know. Is is there's only, what I they like have? That there's only one team that wins the Super Bowl every year. All the yeah. other teams are aspiring to be that. It's the unfortunate reality of being. And the football. unfortunate reality is Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes have just dominated for the last 25 years in this sport. Right. I, I'll tell you what, nobody's legacy is aging more gracefully than Tom Brady's as more and more comes out about New England and what that life was like and the, like the, the documentary for the Patriots. And they're, they were just as dysfunctional as everybody else. The only difference is Tom Brady was there as the, the bridge between the coaching staff and the players, and he took less money for 20 years so that the Patriots could sign other players, and he didn't push the quarterback market upwards. And that was the Patriot way. Now that at its core is why the Patriot way worked. You've seen you had a guy who was willing to sacrifice for the betterment of the team and also took a lot of shit to be yep. in the position that he got in. Yep. Kyle, you are the man. Nobody does it better than you. I don't care what anybody says. All right. What do you got coming up over on Locked On Dolphins, man? I know you got a lot of stuff coming up. Yeah, so we're doing player profiles. We're watching tape on the college prospects. We've we've done about 10 offensive linemen, 10 wide receivers. We're going to try to get to about 150 total prospects before the draft. Okay. Uh, we'll do three or four players a day and just kind of presenting them from like a scouting report style, where they would get drafted, how they would fit Miami. Um, and that'll lead us up to the week of the draft. And we'll do like final rankings and like my, final mock draft, all my picks. That'll all come out right before the draft this year. Look, man, I love having you on. Where can people find you on social media? I'm at grinding the tape on just about everything. So okay. it's at grinding the tape. It's, it's me. 
Guys, Kyle Krabs is one of the best in the business. If you guys want, want to go check out his content, go to social media, go to at grinding the tape. But if you're on YouTube, go to Locked On Dolphins. Locked On has got some of the best content out there for your Miami coverage. Locked On Panthers with my man Armando. Uh, they got Locked On Marlins with Peter, I think. And then they got Locked On uh, Heat uh, uh, with Wes. And they have they Locked On. Yeah, and Dono with locked up. How how could I forget my guy Dono? I, I didn't forget you, my my guy. Uh, they got locked on Hurricanes with with Alex Dono, uh, my my former compadre. We used to we used to be we, we used to work in the same building. That's my guy. And then uh, we also have the great and wonderful Kyle Krabs on Lockdown Dolphins, the greatest football team there is. If you like today's show, do me a huge favor in the comments section below. Right. If you agreed or you disagreed with Kyle, we'll be more than happy to go back and forth with you. Kyle, I want to have you back on the show uh, either right before the draft or right after the draft or maybe both, uh, because I know there's going to be a lot to dive into and get into. I love having you on, brother. Thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Steven. Good catch, man, as always. Just let me know when you want to go. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Krabs, Clock Blockers.